Swayam Prabha. Digital India. Educated India. Hello learners, welcome back to the series of Introduction to Science Fiction Studies. We have so far come across the concept of time, concept of space. Now we are going to also talk about the concept of aliens. Alien and science fiction, they have so much in common. Since the time immemorial, people have been thinking about is there any life outside this planet? Is there anywhere somebody, some intelligent species who can come and contact with uh, the human beings living on this planet? Is there a possibility that there is another planet on this entire solar system which has intelligent life forms? Intelligent mean in the sense there can be cockroaches also in other planets. In that case, we will not have any communication with them. Intelligent in the sense that the way we are intelligent, the way we are thinking about the solar system, we are thinking about the universe, we are thinking about life, we are thinking about interstellar travels. So are there any other species in this entire universe who are thinking the same? Maybe they do not have the technology, maybe they do not have the voice to uh, do that, but if there is, there should be uh, at least a signal, at least a knowledge in our domain that there we are not alone, right? So loneliness has always been a part of our day-to-day -day life, but at least in this universe, are we the only planet where life is growing, right? So aliens and science fiction. First, we will discuss the term alien. Anytime you use the term nowadays, I saw an alien. What does it mean? It means you saw somebody from the outer space, somebody who has come from a different planet, let's say has come from Proxima Centauri, it's another um, galaxy, the nearest galaxy, from there uh, uh, a life form has come and uh, you have seen that person. That is what we mean, right, alien when we use the word. Coming from another planet, extraterrestrial. Terra, this terra, this particular word, it means earth. So extraterrestrial, that means outside the earth. Extra means outside, right? So extraterrestrial is something which is outside the earth. And in movies and pop culture, whenever we use the term alien, we exactly mean that. It's somebody from outer space, somebody from outer planet, somebody who is not a human being but is still intelligent and if you uh, see the movies you will find green color people with uh, very thin hands and a big head and bug eyes. All those features are there uh, when we, uh, all those ideas come to our head when we talk about aliens, right? Most importantly, what it does, it suggests otherness and differences. So let, let us get the first things first and let us get it right uh, straight at the very beginning. That is, we can never imagine human beings just the way we are exactly this human being in another planet. We always imagine that in another planet, the life form will be different, the uh, atmosphere will be different, the biosphere will be different, the lithosphere will be different. So the human beings that we see on this planet, this particular being rep uh, representing something like this, they will also have different shape, different language, if any, if they are intelligent different organic system they will have a uh, different culture all of this because the atmosphere in that other planet is different
so differences and otherness what is the meaning of the uh, word otherness i is i uh, whatever is outside this i is other right that is otherness so the concept of i i being the subject is the most important thing for me there is a very popular song of the beatles if you are into music i me mine all through the day i me mine i me mine i me mine it's a uh, you can recite it as a poem as well that is throughout the day i am singing about i me and mine whatever is mine so i is always a subject subject means subjective experiences i am not bothered about whatever you are thinking i am bothered about what my feelings are i am not at all interested in what your passions are what your uh, opinions are the only thing that i care about is my opinion that is my subjectivity whatever is outside my subjectivity whatever is outside my domain of experience of my expertise that is the other so aliens are the others they are from the other world my world is earth so first of all there is a big kind of discrimination i care for my safety i don't care for your safety because you are the other so there are multiple um, dynamics in relationship uh, concerning i and the other and differences we will shortly be discussing why these differences matter and why are we calling them alien popularized in usa so this particular word alien this was not what it supposed to uh, what it means nowadays earlier the word alien meant something completely different let us have a look at that by the chinese exclusion act 1882 usa the federal government of usa passed an act in 1882 the name of the act was chinese exclusion act chinese nationals were made permanent aliens that is what the act said permanent aliens excluding them from us citizenship so in 1882 usa decided no more chinese in usa if you are a chinese national you have to leave if you are chinese by ethnicity you have to leave and there is no immigration you cannot come from china to us or you, even if you are here you will have to go back so according in that particular act chapter 7 of the title 8 of the united states code that chapter actually is titled as aliens and nationality so alien in at that political concept actually meant who does not belong to this land who has not been born to this land who does not have the subjective experience of this land has come from somewhere else it generally meant the immigrants immigrants from other countries right then they passed the anarchist exclusion act exclusion means to exclude somebody from somewhere next is anarchist exclusion act now here you see the word exclusion is also here another word exclusion is also here what do we mean by excluding exclusion that is you want to exclude somebody uh, include means you um, bring somebody inside your group inside your thought inside your actions excluding is just the opposite you send somebody away you are not including them within your group so exclusion act and by not including them you are making them aliens right so that was the concept us government promoted at that time through these exclusion acts and moreover it is more interesting the name of the act the long title it is called the long title of the act the long title of the act is an act to regulate the immigration of aliens into united states do we mean to say that aliens have come from a different planet and they are wanting us citizenship does it mean that no of course not it meant the emigrants who are coming from a different country now usa
considering itself the most important subject there is, whatever is other, whatever is foreign, whatever is outside its boundaries, outside its perimeters, all of those things were considered as aliens, right? So alien word was actually meant for that particular idea. Then, of course, it began to be meant something completely different. The first work of science fiction, which constituted of such characters, is Edgar Rice Burroughs, A Princess of Mars in 1912. A Princess of Mars in 1912, this novel first talked about Martians, Martians as aliens very grotesque looking, very, you know, terrible kind of uh, beings they were portrayed as. But if you watch the movie, uh, actually this novel was adapted later on into a uh, movie of uh, the name as John Carter. I am writing the name. If you want to see, you can have a look at it. John Carter. John Carter movie series, you will find this kind of alien characters. So this particular novel written by Edgar Rice Burroughs, who is also famous for having written the entire compendium of works related to the Tarzan series. This particular author was the first one to talk about aliens in novels. Trends in alien science fiction. So once we have talked about, uh, we have started with the beginning, now we are moving forward. A.G. Wells, The First Men in the Moon, 1901. You might remember or we might talk about in the next uh, sections, upcoming sections of science fiction movies, we have talked about The First Men in the Moon as a kind of inspiration to the first science fiction movie that was ever made, A Trip to the Moon. We will discuss that later on. The First Selenite that Wells travelers see is an ant person. So that the previous one, the first book that was ever written was about a Martian and now we have a Selenite, a moon dweller and it was an ant person, a complicated insect carrying a body case with goggles and spikes on the head. So the body case is that of an ant and uh, it is standing upright it has a head, there are some two goggles on the um, head and some spikes. They cannot agree whether they are seeing a kind of man or not because he is a hybrid creature, physically resembling a large ant but possessing intelligence and technology as they realize when taken captive. Now these people who have traveled to moon, they are taken captive by these aliens on the moon. So they have the physique of an ant but the intelligence of a human being. So that is again a concept this book has um, explored. Then the bug-eyed monsters. From then onwards people around the world started writing uh, science fiction related to aliens. Now here we will mention once again the pulp magazines. Pulp magazines are those uh, magazines which are uh, produced at a very low cost because of the cheap paper quality they were um, using. Therefore, everybody could buy and everybody could contribute also. So these pulp magazines started telling stories about aliens. People started writing, they started publishing, right? So everybody was suddenly, uh, everybody was suddenly enamored with the idea of alien and human interaction. So there, this thing was very popular, bug-eyed monster. That is, if you see the eyes of a bug, especially a fly, you will see that they have this kind of eyes. This is the face of an alien. So these eyes were, uh, and they did not have any eye pupils or the kind of eyes we have. This entire thing was black. So I'm, I'm drawing a happy face of an alien for you with antennas over here. So this particular image, it was very popular during the rise of the alien and science fiction genre. 
then we have alien aggression this is an happy alien who is willing to talk to us uh, very comfortable with us the humans are doing the first contact first communication uh, everything is happy but then the movies or the trends changed to become aggressive the aliens now are aggressive they are invading the planet they are taking humans a uh, captive they are coming to the earth and abducting human beings from many places and uh, doing experiments on their bodies so the trend shifted and aliens to bug eyed aliens then from bug eyed aliens to aggressive aliens now these aliens are angry okay and from aggressive aliens from one by one aggression it became an invasion that is the entire alien race of another planet has come to our planet and is trying to uh, destroy all the human beings and capture the planet right so this kind of invasion this idea was then gradually developed from the previous ideas then a popular trope began with the meteorite crash so if there is no alien invasion if there is no uh, alien first contact but the people are not going aliens are not coming how can we then talk about alien science fiction on earth now the the third thing that evolved is that a meteorite strikes from um, a meteorite falls from sky into the earth and that meteorite has alien life in it and that alien life again starts changing the reality around itself it is affecting people it is going and infecting other people all these things are happening even today even today if you go and watch the movies like men in black and uh, its variations you will find a meteorite has come from the sky and it is doing uh, all the it is creating that kind of thing then you also have the famous movie venom which is an extension of the spider-man series so venom is also like that a meteorite which has come from the sky aliens as metaphors spreading inclusivity now of course aliens we saw that how the concept of aliens came into being first of all they were actually human beings immigrants from other countries but now we are seeing that they are not only coming from other countries they are coming from outer space so the gradual idea of shifting the uh, concept of aliens from human beings to outer space was the major idea was estrangement estrangement is it roughly means to make something unfamiliar once you make something unfamiliar you are no longer attached to it right so initially when the immigrant problem was very much prominent in the us the human beings the citizens were very much uh, aware of it but slowly what the movie industry did was shift the idea of the aliens from human beings to something from outer space thereby human beings were freed from that kind of captivity of idea so it actually helped in spreading inclusivity even when they are immigrants right now but they are not aliens aliens for now our idea of life has grown out of this world we now are aspiring to go into the solar system and search for some life form outside this planet so we know that the human beings that are on this earth are belonging to one species it is not a time of exclusivity now it is a time of inclusivity we consider all the humans a part of this human race right so the concept of alien actually helped human beings to bond with each other these are some common themes in alien based science fiction exploration of the unknown the unknown imagining and describing encounters with alien beings from distant planets or dimensions alien cultures societies diverse and alien cultures each with its unique characteristics beliefs and social structures 
offering readers a glimpse into otherworldly societies. Themes of otherness and identity. Alien characters serve as metaphors for exploring themes of otherness, identity, and the human condition. They provide a lens through which authors can reflect on social and cultural issues. First contact. This is a term which is um, very much, which is kind of a uh, terminology used for the first contact of human beings with beings outside the planet. So if you ever hear this word being used in the higher academics or especially with reference to science fiction or with reference to science, you must understand that this term, this phrase first contact always means that. The concept of first contact is a prevalent theme in science fiction literature where human beings encounter extraterrestrial beings for the first time, leading to profound consequences and sometimes conflict. So not always the aliens are happy. They are aggressive also like I said because the trends are changing. Then there is alien invading human beings on this planet. Especially if you read H.G. Wells' War of Worlds, you will see that multiple aliens have come from a different world and they have attacked the human race. There are machines, they are um, you know, taking humans, drinking the blood, throwing the bodies. These things are happening, using laser rays to kill all the human beings on the planet. So aggressive alien activity. So all this time, First contact is not always very happy. First contact has always, uh, can be sad and uh, terrible also, right? So these are some of the common themes that are explored in alien science fiction. Then we have galactic civilizations. Expansive galactic civilizations with diverse alien species coexisting. So now it is not one alien species anymore. We have species from planet A, planet B, planet C, planet D and everybody has come to a particular space station. They are waiting for their train to a different planet. So this kind of um, galactic species uh, getting together and sitting down, this has come with the making of the movies like Star Trek and Star Wars. There you will find this species coexisting uh, kind of scenario. Challenges to humanity. Challenges to humanity's beliefs, ethics and perceptions of the universe, prompting characters to question their place in the cosmos. So now we are discussing humanity's range. Now humanity has gone beyond the earth limit. Now we know that there can be multiple variations of cultures. We know that human beings have a different set of principles, a different set of ethics. If we go out of this planet, that ethics can change. That culture can change. And we have to accept it because it is not our planet. It is not our domain. The simple knowledge is that they can give us some challenge. For example, they are invading our planet because their ethical policy says that planet invasion is a must. Every 10 years, you must invade a planet, you must kill human beings and then, then return. Who knows? It is their culture. So if we are to abide by their culture, then we will die. So we will resist. So this kind of interaction, cultural interchange, cultural exchange happens. Speculation on alien biology. Explore various speculative alien biology from humanoid aliens to highly exotic and unimaginable life forms. In science fiction, alien biology is another again very interesting topic. If we, if you just watch the movie Alien, which is uh, actually the name of the movie is Alien, Arnold Schwarzenegger starring, you will see that alien has, you know, hands and legs and feet, but only the hands are different and uh, the face is different. Uh, there are multiple, um, you know, parts of the face which opens. It's very grotesque looking actually, but still the biology, everybody thinks that why the biology should be like that. There must be a rationalization, there must be a reason. So this is also a concept which is explored in science fiction. Allegory and social commentary. Alien encounters in science fiction can serve as allegories for real world issues, including colonization, imperialism and xenophobia. So if you go and 
colonize a different planet you go and try to capture the power over there and make that planet uh, serve uh, you your planet you get revenue from that planet you get slaves from that planet every time you try to colonize another planet you actually are repeating the story of britain's colonies throughout the world so they are actually serving these stories are actually serving as symbolical references to britain's colonies dystopian and utopian scenarios some science fiction series envision dystopian or utopian societies with the influence of alien beings adding complexity to the narrative so not only the aliens are coming but also we are living in a dystopian world that is like you know a blow uh, to the head that already the world has suffered so much from the nuclear war say apocalypse or any other thing then on top of that there is alien invasion so the complex storylines are like this now we will discuss a very interesting part in our lecture today aliens as characters in science fiction now in war of the worlds by h u wells in 1898 novel is one of the earliest example of alien invasion literature it tells the story of martians invading earth with powerful war machines challenging humanity's dominance on the planet so the martians have come with war machines they are actually their idea is to kill everybody so the first time we envision aggressive alien behavior along with you know the characters of martians you will find it in this particular novel childhood's end by arthur c clarke published in 1953 this novel explores the arrival of benevolent aliens called the overlords who usher in a new era for humanity unlike what ag wells had done for ag wells the martians were terrible they wanted to kill everybody but clark imagines a better world a bet- with better aliens actually the overlords who come from a different planet they are kind hearted they want to help the people on the earth with their advanced knowledge of science and technology so now we know that not only aggressive alien characters are there in the science fiction there are benevolent kind and generous alien characters are also there right so next we move on to solaris by stanislaw lem first published in 1961 solaris is a philosophical science fiction novel that deals with the enigmatic oceanic entity on the planet solaris which manifests visitors innermost thoughts and desires so this is again a philosophical science fiction and the the entity the oceanic entity that is there is a, a creature or entity because it does not have any particular hands or limbs so we are calling it an entity that particular entity has the capability of manifesting the visitor who are visiting that particular place the that particular ocean innermost thoughts and desires so this alien this alien entity entity is again and i'm telling you it's a being kind of thing right so this particular entity has the ability to understand to read the mind and then project it that this is what you want right it is not only saying what it is but manifest it make it happen in front of your eyes then we have the left hand of darkness by ursula k le guin this 1969 novel is part of le guin's hainish cycle we have talked about it uh, hain is a particular tribe who goes throughout the space and colonizes multiple planets so hainish cycle it follows the story of an envoy sent to a distant planet called gethan where the inhabitants are ambisexual and have no fixed gender so here also Uh, Ursula K Le Guin actually experiments with the idea of gender construction that is every time they have this ambi sexual kind of thing that is they are always in potential of being a male or a female they only assume their sex when it is the mating time or the kemer it is a, a ritual a kind of time when the uh, planetarians the pla- inhabitants of this particular planet they mate only then they reveal or they assume a particular sex so they can either be male or they can either be female so it can be considered this particular alien characters 
can be considered as uh, symbolical references to human beings as well because sometimes we do some masculine work masculine i'm saying because gender is a construct and some of the works like the manual labor people say that manual labor is for men so that kind of work if it is a woman is doing that does that make the woman a man no so a human being is doing a manual labor so that kind of gender fluid idea was present in this particular book and the alien characters are the one who presented it great annihilation by jeff vandermeer the first book in the southern reach trilogy 2014 explores the mysterious area x an alien landscape that undergoes radical and often terrifying transformation so annihilation is a novel by jeff vandermeer and it is the first book uh, jeff vandermeer has written a tr trilogy again the southern reach trilogy it is about a place called area x and this landscape undergoes um, radical changes along with the presence of the aliens in it dune by frank harbert set in a distant future on the desert planet arrakis dune features various alien species not one alien species but many alien species right including the giant sandworms and the spice melange which plays a crucial role in interstellar travel so not only the aliens over there are uh, characters they are also playing a part in making the interstellar travel happen to begin with right so ring world by larry niven published in 1970 this novel introduces the concept of a colossal artificial ring world home to numerous alien species and an intriguing exploration of advanced technology so ring world is like a ring around a particular point so in that world the multiple alien species are living together again that concept of galactic uh, kind of thing galactic species all together uh, it is a time for inclusion not of exclusion like the exclusion acts of usa so you must collect all the ideas and remember it like that so this ring world uh, is again that kind of story where all these species from different galaxies come together and stay ender's game by orson scott card first published in 1985 this novel follows the young protagonist ender wiggin who is recruited into a military training program to prepare for a future alien invasion so this particular boy ender ender is a young boy let me tell you and he has exceptional talents he is very intelligent even as a young boy so he has to plan a strategy to defeat the aliens who are going to come and invade the planet right so it is also a very interesting novel hyperion by Dan Simmons. In 1989, this 1989 novel is part of the Hyperion Canto series and follows a group of pilgrims traveling to the distant world of Hyperion while sharing their personal stories. So again, the aliens that we find in this particular story, they are the inclusive kind, they are the benevolent kind, they are the kind kind right so uh, this particular uh, alien um, uh, topography that we are getting over here the alien population they are again in harmony with each other they are going to a place to visit that place they are going together in a spirit of uh, alienhood and what else we can say and they are uh, this particular journey is also reminiscent of uh, the canterbury tales by geoffrey chaucer right there also the pilgrims get together from various professions. Somebody is a miller, somebody is a knight, somebody is a, a nun, somebody is a nun's uh, priest, somebody is working uh, as a square. So everybody is coming together and taking that journey towards the tomb of Thomas Beckett, right? So in that journey, they are also telling stories to each other. This particular novel is similar to that, an inclusive kind of novel. The Three Body Problem by Liu Cixin, originally published in 2008, the Chinese science fiction novel deals with humanity's first contact with an alien civilization and the complex consequences that follow. 
So this story is again about the first contact. Remember I talked about the first contact before that whenever you hear the word first contact, it means that that is the first time human beings are contacting or getting in touch with an alien civilization, with an alien race. That is the first contact. Now we are going to uh, look into the popular alien characters throughout the alien universe, right? Uh, be it movies, be it uh, novels, we have some very interesting and very fascinating characters. Spock is one of the most famous, uh, it is in Star Trek. Spock, the half Vulcan, Vulcan is again a type of uh, alien, half human character from Star Trek is cultural icon. His struggle to reconcile logic and emotion has resonated with audience for decades, making him one of the most beloved and enduring characters in science fiction. So Spock here is not only uh, an alien, but an alien with a very sound faculty of heart and mind. This particular character has put forward an ideal a level, a standard to which human beings must rise, right? Next we have E.T. E.T. is by far the sweetest alien character you will get to know. E.T. the extraterrestrial, the adorable and friendly extraterrestrial from Steven Spielberg's film became a symbol of friendship and the search for connection with beings from beyond the world. So E.T. comes from space in a spacecraft, but the spacecraft is damaged, so E.T. cannot go home. E.T. is taken care of by uh, some a group of kids, and the kids try to protect E.T. from the um, government, from the people who want to experiment on E.T., and all sorts of things, and they call it E.T. It's such a beautiful story of friendship. You will love it. It's especially very popular with the kids. Yoda, Star Wars. Yoda is again a very beautiful character. Nowadays, the meme goes around in Instagram, Baby Yoda. Because in Mandalorian, the movie series that, uh, the TV series that has been uh, recently in past one and a half years, Mandalorian uh, has been revisiting the Star Wars uh, landscape. There you will find baby Yoda, but in the Star Wars actual movies, you will find a fully grown Yoda, right? Yoda, the wise and powerful Jedi master, is known for his unique speech patterns and profound wisdom. So Yoda does not, Yoda says the sentences uh, in a different way. When you hear Yoda's sentences, you will find it alien. Because um, let's say I just said when you hear Yoda's sentences, you will find it alien. If this sentence is going uh, through the uh, speech pattern of Yoda, you will see, uh, you will hear something like this. You will find it alien when you hear Yoda's sentences. So he says the subordinate clauses first and the main clause later, something like that. And profound wisdom. Now, Yoda has profound wisdom. Yoda is an old being by the time uh, the movie, actually the story unfolds. He has lived for centuries and he has the knowledge of the universe, the knowledge of the force within him. And he uh, tries to motivate all the people around him to follow the positive path, to follow the path of the force. He represents the epitome of a mentor and has become an iconic figure in the Star Wars franchise. So if there is any mentor there ever was, that person should always try to be like Yoda. It's, it's an iconic figure again. Predator, Predator franchise. The Predator, a formidable alien hunter, is famous for its advanced technology and stealthy uh, tactics. This extraterrestrial antagonist has been the center of numerous films and crossover events. The film I was talking about earlier uh, about um, uh, starring Arnold Schwarzenegger, the actual name of the movie is Predator. Predator is a person who has come from space and is trying to kill human beings. So Arnold Schwarzenegger as a part of a military team goes to capture this Predator. But the predator is very intelligent and it 
uh, tries to find it, it has heat sensitive vision so advanced technology heat sensitive vision it can locate human beings by sensing heat but we do not have heat sensitive visions so we cannot find the predator but the predator can find us very easily so that is uh, a duel you will find it very interesting and also very horrifying let me tell you then we have the xenomorph alien franchise the xenomorph also known as the alien is a terrifying and deadly extraterrestrial creature that has become synonymous with the horror genre and body horror in particular body horror is that the creature itself is terrible it has tentacles it has mandibles mandibles like uh, it has pincers it has all sorts of grotesque thing that you can imagine then it it will eat people whoever are around that per particular creature so whenever you talk about body horror you remember alien the xenomorph mork mork and mindy played by robin williams mork is an eccentric and humorous alien who brought laughter to audiences in the hit tv show mork and mindy so mork and mindy is a very popular tv show played by robin williams i'm sure if you are not familiar with the name of robin williams you just go and type jumanji or let's say dead poet society you will see one of the best movies one of the best acting skills of robin williams in those kind of movies so uh, robin williams was actually a uh, famous for his comedy roles he uh, even if it is a serious role he made it in uh, turned it into such you know simple comedy that you will love it so in mork and mindy uh, mork was the alien and it was played by robin williams doctor who the doctor an enigmatic and time traveling alien from the long running british tv series has taken various forms throughout the show's history embodying a sense of adventure and heroism so again an alien from outside the space of the earth outside the timeline of the earth he is traveling to and fro and tries to grapple with many issues of this planet so it is also a long running british tv series then we have lilu the fifth element lilu portrayed by mila jovovich is a mysterious humanoid humanoid means looking like a human who plays a pivotal role in saving humanity in the action packed film the fifth element so something happens in fifth element and this particular alien lilu who looks like a human being plays an important part becomes the friend of humanity the navi now if i want to pronounce navi you see that i have to make an extra effort because of this particular tiny dot over here that is a small apostrophe placed on the letter a it is there because the letter a is not pronounced in that culture in the way we pronounce it we say navi but they will have a kind of aggressive they will gulp some air down and push some air out of the belly and then produce that a ah. so it will be na v something like that the nagvi the blue skinned humanoid aliens from james cameron's avatar represents a harmonious connection to nature and the consequences of human greed and colonization just go and watch the movie it's a very popular hit in the avatar you will find the navi tribe they are a very peace loving tribe they are living in their own planet but the human beings they are greedy they go to the planet pandora and they want that very uh, there is a there is an uh, element over there which is very priceless something may, might be unobtainium or something like that so they destroy the entire navi civilization tribes in order to get that element so that is uh, human greed and colonization for you then we have martians were of worlds the martians in age wells were of worlds symbolize the fear of invasion and the vulnerability of human against technologically advanced alien forces we have discussed it multiple times so no point in uh, coming back to it Now we are going to look at a very interesting project undertaken by human beings in search of intelligent species on the entire galaxy. Yes, 
we are going to talk about the Voyager projects. Everybody on this planet should know about this particular project that human beings have taken uh, up, right? The scientists from all around the world have gathered together and have contributed to this project. This is human beings reaching out to the universe. What is the mission objective? The primary objective was to study the outer planets of our solar system including Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus and Neptune. It aimed to provide detailed information about these planets and their moons. Twin spacecraft. Two spacecrafts, Voyager 1 and Voyager 2, launched in 1977. So not only one, there are two Voyagers actually. They were identical and designed to explore different trajectories to encounter multiple planets. So in 1977, uh, these two Voyagers were launched. Grand Tour Mission The trajectory of the Voyager spacecraft was carefully planned to take advantage of a rare alignment of the outer planets that occurs every 176 years. This allowed both Voyager 1 and 2 to conduct a grand tour of the outer planets without the need for significant course corrections. The way these two spacecrafts were launched from Earth, they went around, uh, you know, looking after the planets in such a way, that such an alignment here were the planets at different ways that it did not need to correct its course. So that was something that occurs in every 176 years, right? Jupiter encounter. So Voyager 1 conducted its closest approach to the Jupiter to Jupiter on March 5th, 1979. So two years after it launched, it uh, passed through, you know, had a look at Jupiter from its closest. And Voyager 2 on July 9th, 1979, because Voyager 1 and Voyager 2, they, they were launched together, but they had some different work. So, while Voyager 2 passed Jupiter in uh, July, they revealed new details about Jupiter's complex atmosphere, rings and its moons, including volcanic activity on Io. So, the uh, Voyager, they were collecting data from all the planets of the solar system. Saturn encounter. Voyager 1 performed its closest approach to Saturn on November 12, 1980 and Voyager 2 on August 25, 1981. They discovered intricate ring structures and new moons around Saturn. So, the moons around Saturn that we talk about that Jupiter and Saturn, they have the maximum number of moons. So, previously some of the moons we did not even know about. These particular projects, they allowed us to have a better idea of our solar system. Continuing mission. So, after they cross Jupiter, after they cross Saturn, what happened? continued their journey into interstellar space. Interstellar space means outside the solar system. So, they have gone through all the six planets over there and now uh, Pluto is not considered a planet anymore. It is a small, you know, semi-planet kind of thing. So, now they have crossed that entire area and they have gone into outer space. Continued their journey into interstellar space, they became the first human-made objects to reach the outer boundaries of our solar system. So now my question is, what are they doing over there? Golden record. So you will be fascinated to know, each Voyager spacecraft carries a golden record containing sounds and images representing Earth. So, the records they have, the, you know, records are not like digital records. They had, you know, disc-like records, the records they play in gramophone, right? That kind of records. They have two such records in them from which contains sounds and images from Earth. So, anybody who plays that record, if somebody out there in this entire universe, if somebody, some intelligent species comes across this particular uh, spacecraft and gets hold of the record, 
they will know that we have sent it. We have sent it with a, a vision that you will accept, you will know that we exist. We have sent out a signal in space that yes, human beings are here and please respond if anybody is listening. See, beautiful, see, images representing Earth's diversities. The record serves as a message to any extraterrestrial civilization that might encounter the spacecraft in distant future. Maybe 50,000 years from now, somebody somewhere gets that record which is on that spacecraft and gets to know, oh, 50,000 years ago, uh, there was a planet, uh, the name of Earth, and this was the sound, this was the image from that planet. So it is interesting, right? Now, pioneering discoveries. The Voyager spacecraft provided valuable data on the magnetic fields, radiation belts, and cosmic rays in the outer solar system. They also confirmed the existence of previously unknown rings and moons around the gas giants. Interstellar mission. Voyager 1 officially entered interstellar space on August 25, 2012. So, in 2012, in the year 2012, Voyager 1 officially entered interstellar space, that is space outside the solar system, becoming the first human-made object to reach the space between the stars, right? So, from outside the gravity of one star and going to another solar system. They are uh, moving in that way. Longevity surpassed its original mission duration. Originally, it was, uh, you know, everybody was expecting that it will be destroyed in a matter of years. But it is still there. It is still going from 1977 onwards, right? Both Voyager 1 and 2 continue to communicate with Earth. Even after this is 2023 we are talking about and that was launched in 1977. So 23 years here and 23 years here, a total of 46 years. Even after 46 years, these two space engines, these two marvels of human imagination and technological uh, development, they are moving out, pushing the boundaries of space and human reach. Someday in future, they might encounter some advanced civilizations on this uh, entire galaxy, in this entire universe. We are still waiting for that signal from that spaceship. Now, this is the time we take some quizzes to sort out whatever information we have gathered so far. How have depictions of alien characters in science fiction evolved from the early works of H.G. Wells to contemporary novels and films? In what ways do authors and filmmakers use alien characters as metaphors to comment on human society and cultural norms in science fiction literature? We discussed this while we were discussing the gender concerns, right? How do early science fiction stories such as War of the Worlds set the foundation for the portrayal of alien invaders and extraterrestrial threats in later works? How has the portrayal of friendly and benevolent aliens like E.T. like E.T. or the Na'vi from Avatar contributed to the development of a more positive view of extraterrestrial life in science fiction? What role do alien characters play in exploring themes of identity, belonging and otherness in science fiction series? So all of these things we have discussed throughout the course of the lecture. If you are still feeling unsure, you can just go back and have uh, another look at the places where I was discussing about the culture, the society, the Exclusion Act, USA, immigration. All of these things are actually uh, the elements which go on to make up alien characters. In what ways have female or gender fluid alien characters been represented in science fiction literature and how do they challenge traditional gender roles? Now we come to the reference section. From here you will get an idea that if you want to know more about the alien and science fiction encounters, then you can have a look at these things. Alien Encounters, Anatomy of Science Fiction, it's a book by uh, Mark Rose and published from Harvard University Press. So I, I, I can assume that uh, this is a very nice book. My personal favorite is Science Fiction, A Very Short Introduction, 
if you are a beginner looking for the basic idea of how this everything originated you can just take a look at david seed's book apart from that the only good alien is a dead alien science fiction and the metaphysics of indian hating on the high frontier you will just have a look at it it's a very funny paper and also very informative Wendy Pearson, Alien Cryptography is the view from queer. So, observing alien and its ideologies with reference to queer literature, that is something which is explored in this book. Jenny Wormark, Aliens and Others, Science Fiction, Feminism and Postmodernism. So, once we enter into the field of postmodernism studies, then uh, the conceptual understanding about alien and the literature attached to it becomes completely different. Of course, its interpretation becomes completely different. So, I hope you have enjoyed the lecture and um, I hope you get to love some of the characters, alien characters we have discussed so far. I am very um, optimistic that if in future you encounter an alien, you will first try to uh, think of whether it is aggressive or it is malevolent and act accordingly and wisely. Thank you very much for watching this lecture. Hello and welcome to this piece of literary snippet. Perhaps the most popular literary genre after novel is the short story. Sharp, compact narratives whose charm lies not only in what is said, but also in what remains unsaid. Today I will be reading one of the shortest instances of a short story that I have ever encountered. And Indeed, the very charm of this particular story that I am going to read out today lies in the way it abruptly ends. It is an ancient tale from Mesopotamia which has been retold by several authors among whom the name of Somerset Mom stands out. Uh, the adaptation that I will be reading out is perhaps the closest to the one that Mom wrote. The story is titled in all of its adaptations almost as Appointment in Samara. Here is the story. A merchant in Baghdad once sent one of his servants to the market. The servant was supposed to buy provisions for the merchant, but when he returned, he came back empty handed. Indeed, the servant had all gone wiet and trembling with fear, he told his master that he had met death in the marketplace. When I entered the market, the servant said to his master, I was jostled by a woman and when I turned to look at her, I saw that she was death. I am very scared, master, because death looked at me with a threatening gesture. Can you please lend me your horse so that I can fly away from Baghdad to the town of Samara and thereby escape death? The master, being a good man, gave his servant his best horse and saw him gallop off to Samara to escape death. Then the master himself went to the marketplace and confronted death. Why did you make a threatening gesture to my servant? Asked the master to death. And death replied, it was not a threatening gesture. Rather, it was a start of surprise. I was astonished to see your servant here today because this evening I have an appointment with him in Samara.
See you in the next episode of Literary Snippet.